pleasure. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, we have to hit, got it. Yeah, got it. All right, hopefully Zoom land can hear us as well. All right, uh, it's my pleasure to, to introduce uh, Dr. James Bourne as today's Vision Seminar speaker. Um, so a little background, Dr. Bourne earned his PhD uh, in neuropharmacology at King's College. Uh, following his doctoral studies, he uh, undertook a, a postdoc at first the University of Queensland yep. and then moved to Monash University working with Marcelo Rosa. Yep. Um, and there he, he focused on characterizing various physiological um, properties of visual cortical neurons in, in marmosets. Um, James was awarded a prestigious Australian Research Council fellowship. Uh, and I think that really was the catalyst for starting an independent. Uh, area of research exploring the development and maturation of the primate visual system. Uh, from there, James became a group leader at the Australian Regenerative Medicine Institute. Um, and you were there for many years and something around two years, you had this crazy idea, let's move halfway around the world. And, and James moved to the NIH uh, where he, uh, so he uprooted his lab uh, and, and, and uh, he currently serves as the chief of the section of cellular and cognitive neurodevelopment. Um, I am not exaggerating when I say that James truly adopts a multidisciplinary, <laughs> multi-scale approach to investigating the primate visual system uh, across very spatial scales from cellular resolution to, to large-scale brain networks. Uh, it's, a, I think, a truly impressive and just makes uh, his work so much uh, all the more impactful. Uh, he's published uh, foundational studies on the development and plasticity of the primate visual system. Uh, showing how perturbations to specific circuits at particular periods in development uh, can have lifelong implications on visually guided behaviors. I particularly uh, appreciate how James places a central emphasis on the subcortex, particularly the pulvinar uh, in his research. And I'm, I'm really excited to hear what he has to say about the medial pulvinar today. Um, so please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. James Moore. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Mark, for that wonderful introduction. So, yeah, I, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not originally from this part of town, and it's been quite a journey. One of the catalysts to moving to the US was essentially this really, obviously, fantastic, scalable system you have here, which is the NIH and its extramural world. But being part of the intramural world is, is an exceptional opportunity to do long term expensive research in non-human primates. And hopefully by the end of my talk, you'll agree with them that they made the right decision in choosing me. <laughs> so today I want to talk about the pulmonar, especially in, I just wanted to, you know, for me now at this talk of rebuilding the lab, it's a nice time to sit back a bit and, well not sit back, and, but to actually reflect on the work that I've actually been doing over the years and bring me back to that core philosophy. And it's, those early findings you have that you can really see that actually seed you in your journey for research. And I suppose for me, it's always been quite annoying. You know, this, I was talking to Mark about, so the Felleman and Van Essen diagram of the wiring diagram of, which we've all seen in the textbooks still used today of the, you know, visual system architecture. And now we're placing more and more ideology on this brain computer metaphor, but I think it really, is restricting our understanding of those dynamics that circuits actually have, especially during development. And the, especially when we're looking at this diagram, you've got a single unitary input, and this is all a very static wiring diagram that doesn't have any explanation to what are the changes that occur during development and how dynamic that process is, which ultimately leads to a change in behavior. So quite early in my career, and this was around that time when Mark was, said that I was making that career independence break, I was looking at the maturation of the marmoset visual cortex. And in addition to V1, we identified that the, the other, this other visual cortical area known as MT actually matured at the same time. And this is part of the dorsal stream. And this was really interesting. How could it be that there is this other node and we'd, everyone's taught that, you know, it goes V1, V2, V3 outwards with development. How is this node that is quite distal, in fact, from V1, at least in a marmoset, be actually maturing early when the inputs from V1 are very scant still at that point? 
So that got me looking into the alternative uh, areas and essentially that was going to be the pulvana. So yeah, for today, I'm gonna to talk to you about the pulvana nuclei. We essentially, the first part of my talk, which has been the majority of my work to date has been in this part in the Marmoset, but in this region called the medial portion of the inferior pulvana. And more recently, we've moved on to a very different set of experiments uh, in the medial pulvana. So essentially today, I'm gonna to present these two vignettes and provide you background on hopefully your takeaway why these subcortical and these salomocortical circuits are so crucial in development and that they may be actually taking, playing a different role in later life. And I think it comes back to more, Mishkin, I always put this in, studying the brain is both horribly and wonderfully complicated. And I think we still have to think that today. So when I started working in the middle, in this area to define what were the inputs to middle temporary, we didn't really even at that point know what the connections were. There would be, there were some suggested literature that there was retinal input to the pulvina. And then there was much more of a discussion about this part of the pulvina was only recipient of collicular input, which was Bob Wurtz's work. But we actually demonstrated very early on that there was actually a disynaptic input from the retina through the inferior portion of the medial pulvin to the pulvinar to area MT. And what we wanted to actually show was perhaps this actually changed across development. And perhaps this was really crucial in early life. Because what one of the comments I got back when we first demonstrated this pathway, in the, which was in the adult, was it was only about five or six neurons. And it's like, well, what could the role potentially be? There were a few more, I'm talking being facetious there, but it's similar to the same as the K layer input that you see from the K layers of the genicular to area MT. So what we did is we started doing tracer injections, so chlorotoxin injections in marmosets at, in the retina and in area MT. So looking at both retrograde and anterograde inputs, from seven day old mums up through to adult. And then what we could do is because we knew that what the inputs to MT were, which would be primarily from V1, of course, the pulvin and nucleus PIM and the K layers, we could look at the ratios of these as a reference point, because obviously it's really hard to actually do any quantitative tracing work. What was a really amazing result was what we showed that was early in life, there was predominantly a input from the medial portion of the inferior pulvina until about 90 days. And then we had this equal period. And then what happened was there was a switch over when it became mainly the predominant input was coming from the V1. So essentially before that V1 connection had arrived at the middle temporary, the main input which was driving this early maturation of area MT was coming from the inferior pulvina through that direct retina recipient region in the inferior pulvina. So saying that classically, these pathways are driving the maturation of these areas. So we hadn't actually determined what that mechanism was that was essentially pruning that PIM input at this point. But what we decided to do is what would happen in the, if we were actually to ablate V1 early in life, how would that change the dynamics of this input? So in the marmoset monkey, again, we actually unilaterally ablated the V1 at 14 days old, and we let the animal mature until it was an adult. And what we could actually see was that it was actually preventing in the ipsilateral side to the V1 ablation here, it was actually preserving that increased input. We couldn't show, of course, with traditional tracing because we'd actually lost our V1 node, but with the DTI, we could actually see here that there was actually a preservation of that input. Now we're doing some more studies now around this, and we're actually starting to look at some of those cues and the factors that are being released by the V1 input that actually is responsible for pruning of that PIM input. Serendipitous, sure. 
it's not that there's an absolute increase because you can imagine that the number of pulp and argon two fibers could stay the same but you just have a massive dump of d1 into argon that begins to dominate yes so you're showing that as a percentage of the total if you look at the absolute amounts does the absolute amount actually drop of pulp and argon yes so it's actually lot we're we're not sure if that's actually whether you've got collaterals as well but we think it's actually we are getting an absolute drop in number as well yeah Did, have you tried to reverse so have, have you tried to play around or or ablate the the interior part of the folder yes and because that, i mean the way you talked about it it sounds like in terms of the developmental timeline that is there first and correct yes yeah, so i am going to talk about that moment because that has a significant behavioral effect as well. But luckily, well, serendipitously in 2017, we were able, we found this child, case BI, that had received a bilateral injury to V1 at birth through MCAG, which is the needle chain uh, stylcholinesterase dehydroacetyl A, sorry, dehydrogenase deficiency. So he can't convert fatty acids to glucose. So his brain was starved of energy at birth and he actually got a bilateral lesion. And what we actually showed, we, looked, we did a number of, we didn't do them, but Mel Goodale in Canada did this and he did a number of behavioral tests with him when he, we examined him at eight years of age and he was remarkable at playing sports like soccer accurately with a bilateral lesion and a huge loss, massive scotomas in both visual fields. And we actually went on to look as well at the MRI of this child and showed that in fact, in that left pulmonary to MT, there was actually increased preservation of that con connection compared to age match controls. So that we believe that that was actually one of those routes for that preserved inflammation to be routing itself through to the cortex in this child. But of course, it got back to that original question, why does MT develop early? You know, what is instrumental? What is that evolutionary need for area MT to be an early maturing visual cortical area? And like, you know, there's a number of studies that have been done in humans as well, where we've shown that the dorsal screen develops early, that there's a need with reaching and grasping behaviors as well need to be initiated earlier on than essentially the ventral stream areas. And if we think about this in a teleological perspective, within an expanded cortex, it's a bit much to expect V1 is going to be implanting and supplying a carry forward um, in a serial fashion, all this information for the maturation of the cortex. So we thought about how can we actually get to this by essentially performing a lesion of this region of the brain the pulp in early life. One of the real issues that was complicating all of this is unlike the rodent, there was, there's no stereotactic atlas where there wasn't at the time for the marmoset and especially in a neonatal marmoset. So we were really stuck with this idea, how can we actually stereotactically ablate this really small region of the pulvina, the medial portion of the inferior pulvina early in life? What we decided to do, we had a great postdoc in Yaki working with me at the time. We developed a way in which we could develop a stereotactic frame and then in, put the animal in the frame, image the animal on our 9.4T magnet, and then actually take the animal out and create or initiate the system to actually develop the coordinates from that and then get a precise uh, injection site based on the fiducial markers of the eye bars and ear bars. And accurately, we were able to ablate a PD-14 for um, neonatal marmosets. One of the great things about this as well at this time point is that compared to a human, this actually represents an in utero time point. So that's another great advantage of the marmoset. One of the classic ways in which um, mammals have been aligned on the axis is when their eyes open in utero, this known as the sequel period, which Bogdan Drea was the first to really um, classically design and put all, align all the mammals along this. And uniquely, 
for marmosets, the eyes don't open until two days before birth, so very late. So this is, a, you know, up to about PD-21 is considered an utero time point in human development. So one of the downsides, of course, of using a primate, though, is if you're looking at development, you have got a protracted period compared to a rodent. So a marmoset is not actually mature an adult until 18 months, and it's a ju juvenile from about nine months onwards. Um, six to nine months onwards. What we actually did, though, during that period of obviously ablating PIM at PD-14, um, we actually had to wait a significant period. And then what we did is actually during the time point, we actually looked at the FA maps. And what we could see is that there were changes in these regions, AIP, MIP, and of course, MT following the lesion. And when you look at what that structural connectivity and the roles of those areas are, it's essentially MIP is involved in that reach and AIP in that grasp. So we were actually considering very early on, like this was done probably at six months of age. We started to do these between six and 10 months. We considered that actually we could be disrupting that reach and grasp behavior, which is common to that dorsal stream network. What we could also see here is it's overlaid, but we actually looked at the mapping of the connectivity between the areas of MT into these areas, AIP, MIP, et cetera, and actually observed that we had lost connectivity significantly within that area. But also we saw what is overlapped here is a loss of all the interneuron populations within there as well, showing that we've got a really significantly disrupted profile of connectivity and architecture within the cortex. So we then went on to determine what the behavior could be in this, whether these lesions did actually have an impact on the behavior. And this was really a groundbreaking opportunity in some ways because no one had really ever looked at the marmoset for reach and grasp behavior. Now, it is a new world primate, so they don't have an opposable sun. Mm -hmm. So what sort of reach and grasp behavior do you get? So that was our first thing. Did this species have enough of a sort of complex reach to grasp behavior that you would expect? Or was it really going to be a um, pretty dirty sort of grasp behavior? What we identified, though, was really quite exciting was that they actually do have a pre-shaping of their hand. And rather than doing a precision grip as humans we do, when obviously you've all got your cups of coffee, then you know you're going for the precision grip to grab that coffee so it doesn't end on your lap. So they had rather a power grip than compared to a precision grip. But one of the features that they did have that was so important was they did have a pre-shaping to the size of the object. So there was that precision there and we could do the F1 cubes with the animal and actually show that they would actually scale their hand to the size of the object when they reach. So in that experiment that we did, this is the reach and grasp. And what you'll see here is the lesion animal on the bottom and the control animal on the top. The control animal has a very, it has a slightly slower feed forward action, but the PIM lesion animal actually has a more ballistic feed forward, but actually goes to maximum grip aperture and its hand hovers over the size of the object before retrieval. Whereas in the control animal, it had a precise scaling to the size of the object in a much more precise grasp and return. And we've also done this on as well now a moving rotating table and the actual lesioned animals fail to grasp the, the food object. So for this part of the study, it was really exciting because we saw this as a real inflection point here in the emergence of the anthropoids. So that's where we start to see in the emergence of the pulvina, this real characteristic input from a direct retinal input to the pulvina rather than that collicular input alone, and also through this input to MT. So 
essentially, it, we've had this teleological expansion of the visual cortex, which has required this input for it, which has pr proven to be crucial for the development of the visual cortex and visually guided behaviors. For those really precise reach and grasp behaviors, which essentially has emerged in the old world primates. So now the next steps with this, what I've started to rebuild here is we're actually looking more, we fully mapped for you. Have a question? I, well, maybe yeah. you're going to get to it, but have you done maybe that's what this is like the so that's a you're interpreting that developmentally. Have yeah. you done the same manipulation just in the adult, yeah. yeah, we did it. Right? That's a common question, and we didn't see the same effect. We saw zero effect, which was actually quite surprising. I would like to have seen something. Yeah, and we haven't done any recordings in MT. I would say that that's been basic. That has been purely on the reach and grasp behavior. So I should put that caveat on there. This we've not looked at the fully, the full capacity of what it could be having as a functional role. Yeah, that could hold true. Now, I think that's quite hard as neurobiologists for us to accept that there could be redundancy in systems that, you know, retain um, their existence for entirety. But the, I should say that adding to that is that there's a very, there is a small, only a small input in adulthood compared to other parts of the pulmonary, which remain much stronger, like the lateral pulmonary, the inferior pulmonary input to MT is quite small in adults. But the idea that you have a scaffold that helps you, if you want to get the motor system revved up and learning how to grab stuff, and so anyone's not ready, so you've got to go through pulmonary, but then when anyone's ready, you can... Yeah. Well, it's nice to hear you agree that, because people don't, it under this acceptance that we could have a level of redundancy there's got to be a function to an area thread. It's like oh. the face processing is very similar. Yeah. You need to do some face processing when you're interested in when you're interested, so you gotta go through regular one of the support systems. But after and calculus, you don't need to make a lane, but well, yeah. that's important. <laughs> right? Yeah, I think there is a lot to be said about these transient pathways. And it's important that we consider these transients as a de developmental precursor for a very complex system. I think there were a number of people who have looked at this as well as how, you know, it's very theoretical, of course, but how long would it take the visual cortex to mature if everything was bypassing V1? And it was something like 28 years. And, you know, for dorsal stream, that's just far too long. It's, it's just, and ventral stream as well. But, you know, it's... So there is line up with any of the neurotransmitter milestones. I mean, obviously, there's the cool finding the gap of excitatory building development. But that's very early. That's, that's super early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a bunch of myelination yeah. and then milestones and other things that happen. And I'm just wondering if that, if that. It does, because a lot of this, a lot of our understanding of dorsal ventral stream development has all been based on like the myelar architecture, the maturation of interneurons and base and also excitatory cells based on the expression of the calcium binding proteins like carbalbumin and calbindin. So a lot of that is changing and it's, it's concomitant with the changes in the input from PIM. So that's how you really see that. So when I haven't shown it here, but how you essentially, when we've looked at the full development of V1 and MT, and I essentially, I called those as really anchors in development of the dorsal stream. So the, you've got these two nodes. And then from MT, essentially, you've got a, the surrounding areas, MT, MST, and then brew three dorsal into AIP, MIP, reach and grasp areas. So, and that in a mama Z is mature around nine months of age. So that, and I, what I mean by that is it's showing that myelo architecture, expression of the calcium binding proteins as well in the interneuron populations. And, and you know, the perineuronal nets as well. In terms of general, I'm thinking of some of this literature on like cortical interneuron development, the idea that even though these are cortical microcircuits, a lot of the early developmental stuff that they looked at in mice is driven by cell cycle. Yeah. Is that is that just a remnant, like an evolutionary remnant of the structure that just happens to be there early? I mean, like just thalamus in general. Is that something that predates most cortical structures? 
Yes, but a lot of the pole winner doesn't. The pole winner has expanded significantly with, along with the primates. But that's what, again, is aligning us to this idea that, you know, this is an instruction system in some part. So, yeah. So in the 28 years thing, sorry, I can get further on that. Yeah, yeah. What, what is, I didn't understand that. So V1, if you have to wait for V1 to be ready, it would take 28 years. Well, looking at, based on that V1 to MT input and everything passing essentially from a retinogeniculate input, it could be up to 28 years, it was suggested, for the visual cortex to fully mature if there weren't secondary nodes. Yes. Why would it be so long? Because of, you know, just how long. So in our case as well, and a number of people have shown this in MRI studies in humans as well, is the V2 actually takes a considerable amount of time to mature as well. So the satellites of MT are mature before V2 is fully mature. Based, this is based, I'm basing this on architecture, but I believe, you know, there are studies in the human as well. So just thinking of that passage of information through each of these reaching maturity, Anyway, the next, so what we're doing next here is we've actually got now, we want to do partial um, inactivations of a number of the other areas of the pulvina to really understand how instructive that may be on the develop, enduring development. And especially with dreads, we can actually do this temporarily. And we're also now looking at some of the subtypes of cells within the pulvina itself. The interesting thing about the pulvina is there is expression of you know, this is how we've done first order, higher order, based on the expression of calbindin or parbalbumin in each of these um, subsets. So for the medial inferior pulvina, which I just focused on here, that they express parbalbumin in the projection neurons and the flanking areas, PICL, PICM and PIP, all express calbindin. And classically, that's how PIM was defined as by CUSAC was this calbindin whole region. And really, we want to try and emerge it now, even though I'm showing a picture here of the chair marmoset, that which we do, is moving this more into naturalistic behaviors and trying to look at this more naturalistically. But one of the things that I want to switch gears completely now, but it's actually only a few microns if you're looking at the, the brain, is into the medial pulvina. And it's focused on its role in development, especially. And a lot of the literature to date has really come from the road and, and has been on the um, medial dorsal nucleus. But I think this is that an image that really still, I like was showing to Mark earlier, and I think it's just really classic, you know, to look at how even in the marmoset monkey, which I'm using as the model here, the medial pulvina has expanded greatly into the human. And it's such an understudied region of the brain. This is essentially the pulvina as a whole in the human now actually occupies 40% of the thalamus. And with entropy, we can think about its connectivity. And I think looking at where we've seen essentially in the marmoset the emergence of the granular frontal cortex, 946, there is 10, and really into the human here that really expanded frontal cortex what is the role that the medial pulvina plays in the develop in development here of this really you know complex frontal cortex frontal parietal temporal area so when we started this a few years ago we were really chasing ourselves because there was very little information out there on the, the medial pulvina development and anything of that ilk. But what we were concerned about was really some work that came from Pashko Rikishi's lab, which said that the pulvina development was completely different between primates and the human, and that the primate wasn't a particularly good model. He'd done these triliated thymidine experiments where he'd looked at, um, obviously, with the origin of the neurons that were originating into the um, human pulvina and showed that there was actually two waves of pulvina development. And that occurred at 16 and 34 weeks. And their first one was essentially from the subventricular zone. And then this second wave came from the ganglionic eminence. Whereas in the macaque, 
it only originated in the third ventricle and was very early in development. So some of the ideas that the medial pulvina is involved in late gestational disorders like white matter leukomalacia in humans and a number of other disorders such as schizophrenia, which I'll get onto, was suggested that maybe the macaque wasn't the right model or any non-human primate here. So we really had to go back to basics here to look at this largest corpus of the thalamus to really understand, well, is the marmoset going to be a useful model of pulvinar development that's comparable to that of the human? So the classic way of doing this is BRDU now. Obviously, BRDU gets incorporated, uh, the uridine into the DNA, and you can actually uh, label the cell then to actually see this. So what we could confirm in the MAMA Z is that already by E75, which we could see very early on here, the presence of BRDU positive cells in the MAMA Z. Okay. And this actually, and this, and they were also neurons. So we could co-label it with new N as well. And we could see that this was from E75 all the way out to E100. And this was really exciting for us because it suggested that there was actually a extended period of development of the marmoset medial pulvinar that could be more equivalent to that of the human, or maybe it wasn't quite right in the macaque when Pashko originally did those tritiated thymidine experiments because they can't, they're not that easy and not the results are not that always that greatly informative. And, so just in brief, we actually then had to look back and there are ways now using markers of cells that we could actually identify where these two lineages, whether there are separate lineages arriving into different regions of the brain. So we wanted to see whether there was indeed this two way originating from two different regions. So what we can do is all the, the subventricular zone origin cells labeled for PAC6 and all the um, LGE-derived neurons from the ganglionic eminence, which is where he showed that they arose in the human, actually labeled for this molecule called SP8. So essentially what I'm saying here is we could see that in this protracted phase, we have this initial um, origin of cells, which were PAC6 positive, and then conversion to SP8. So essentially the marmoset was more akin to what was observed in the human, where there was a dual wave and that there were origin of the cells was different. So that was really exciting for us to think that maybe we have a useful model here. Then we had to go on and look at the connectivity. And I Did sure. the SP8 stuff that are those like the internals? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they are actually, it's quite an interesting thing because they are projection neurons. They are projection neurons. Yeah. But they're distinct. So the pack six, that's more cortical. That's right. Yeah. But they look similar to the they do look very similar. Yeah. So we haven't fully determined if the, the if I know where you're going, the, the SP8 derived neurons are actually those exact projection neurons into the regions of interest, but they're definitely the projection neurons because the interneuron populations are at the very end wave of that. And it's actually quite interesting that the interneuron population, I'm not showing it here, within the medial pulmonary is very small indeed. It's mainly projection neurons. But in terms of the connectivity with the medial pulvina, that was really an unknown, um, they were really unknown what the connectivity was in any species, except for one study by Patricia Goldman Rakesh, which showed that there was quite extensive connectivity through the frontal parietal cortex and that there was this anterior posterior gradient. So we actually mapped and profiled the connectivity of the um, marmoset medial pulvinar. But in addition to this anterior posterior gradient and a slight medial lateral gradient, we also saw this microunit structure within the medial pulvinar. So we would inject multiple cortical areas and see a microunit structure where you could see the origin of the cells from. So using a retrograde tracer, we could see say like area nine or 46, area eight, 10, that there would be a microunit where two or three the origins of those cells into those multiple units would be within a small cluster within the medial pulvinar, which was quite interesting thinking about that passage of information and the role of the 
thalamus and efferent copy networks as well. We then went on to look at the, this is, we haven't fully completed this, but looking at the development and the origin of those cells. And we saw again early on that there was actually greater input to, from the medial pulvina to the cortex, but also we looked at the corticothalamic affluence as well and saw that originally there was more layer five inputs back to medial pulvina, which were, then became layer six primarily. But I think one of the really exciting things was about what role was this pathway playing in disorders such as schizophrenia. And there was an original study by William Bine who showed that there was a not only a reduction in volume, like everyone shows classically they've got this reduction in volume in schizophrenia in their model, but a 19% reduction in cells number as well, without the gliosis, so suggestive that it could be a neurodevelopmental effect. So we wondered, could we try and mimic aspects of the disorder by lesioning, it, creating that disconnectivity early in life again, how we'd essentially employed it for the PIM? story. So before we went on to that, I got in contact with a psychiatrist, Peter Williamson and, um, and Dorf Pedersen, who've been looking at schizophrenia in human subjects, and got them to actually look at the connectivity between the medial pulvina and the frontal pole. And they should both showed in their studies that indeed between the meat there was indeed a reduced input which was greater than that seen between the medial dorsal nucleus and the frontal cortex that it was far greater within the medial pulvina and frontal cortex in schizophrenia patients so then akin to what we'd done in the pim lesions we lesioned uh, early life at two weeks of age bilaterally the medial pulvina in the marmoset and we bilaterally. And again, we had to wait for 18 months before we could do anything else. So we actually, again, did the FA mapping and looked at the diffusion tractography and noticed significantly in a number of the cortical areas, you can see here, like 946, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, orbital frontal cortex, a significant change in the FA compared to age match controls, which was, Really exciting. The first animal, before we'd moved on to the behavior, we actually then went and looked at the changes in the architecture. And one of the really astonishing features was within the interneuron population, we saw a complete loss of PV um, compared to age match, you know, normal adult, sham lesioned animal here. And this is akin to the work that David Lewis has recently published on schizophrenia, where you actually see we, you know, the gabaergic cells, we can still label them for GAD65, but there's a complete loss of PV in these neurons. And also we saw a reduction in that fast spiking potassium channel, which has been associated with schizophrenia as well, KB3.1B. So one of the things that we need to do then, of course, was actually to determine, can we actually look at the function? How can we get at the function and see what's happening both cognitively and um, with EEG or electrophysiologically, knowing that we'd lost these PV interneurons, which have suggested to be the you know, critical generators of the cortical gap. Yeah, so this is something we're actually doing to prove, and I, I, I'm going to, I'm hypothesizing here, so take it with a greater sword if you wish, but essentially what we're thinking is that early in life, the PM neurons, so those thalamic neurons are actually synapsing on those interneuron population, okay? Now, what it looks like is happening, and you know, I've only got a single animal of each because we've got the pseudotype rabies virus with the S5E2 enhanced, which specifically labels um, part of our women cells because it's been very hard to actually get viruses to target PV interneurons. So one of Gord Fischel's in 
answers. And we actually have showing that we think what's happening is that early in life, the PM neurons are synapsing on to PV interneurons, and then that changes in adulthood and they restrict themselves to pyramids. And we think that they're tuning potentially um, the population of interneurons in the front of the pole. But it's like a it's like a developmental program that's not being driven, right? Because if you don't see PV, you don't see KV3, like those are all yeah. the sort of down, you know, if you want to make an FS cell, right? There's certain transcriptional programs in there. Those are like some of the proximal things. So the cells are still there. Yes, absolutely. They are just like a, kind of more all purpose internal, or they're an internal that's maybe a little less. We're not finely tuned. Yeah. They're more in that developmental phase. And I think you, thinking about it in, from what we really, the textbook ideology, which is essentially that's corticocortical function that's driving the maturation of interneurons, especially in the frontal cortex. So we're not thinking of it as being thalamic driven because it, MD has obviously been that focus and there's never been this idea that, you know, MD is responsible for the maturation of the interneuron population. But it's more being driven by that understanding of the corticocortical input from more and you know striatal input, which is probably more your yeah, yeah. No, I mean I think there's also more, and you mentioned where I thought his lab had some stuff. It wasn't with I can remember it being with PV. So are the SST interneurons also affected or is it just so I'm only showing the PV here, but yes, the SST neurons are affected as well. And there's obviously a high number of those in the front the cortex as well. But we focused on the PV because they are those fast spiking sure. ones which are classically described. But anyway, what we needed to develop was, you know, really, apart from Angela Roberts at Cambridge, no one was really doing much marmoset behavior. So we wanted to develop this touch screen system where we could also get EEG as well. I, working with marmosets for a long part of my career, I really started, I know their behavior and ripping an animal out of its cage each day and shoving it in an operant chamber probably isn't the way to go. So we developed an in-cage operant chamber where we can run now eight of these uh, for every cage that we have has one of these operant chambers, which we build ourselves. So it's quite a simple architecture. It's essentially a touch screen uh, with a mini PC that drives PsychoPi that goes back to an S. QL database that's collecting all the information from the age cages. We have these Raspberry Pi Wi-Fi cameras to monitor the animal. And just uh, Arduino is like what Mike's using with the tree shrews to run a peristaltic pump. Also, what we could do is use DSI, which was our first pass at this. We're moving on to using the neuro gadgets head stage now with a multi um, site cortical EEG, but we've got two channel EEG, which we correlate to an NTP network to actually align the touchscreen task with the um, ECOG data as well. And that's where we are at the moment. So one of the great things is we actually did a delayed match to sample. This is just showing you a marmoset. Interestingly, they actually don't use their hand that much. They actually nose poke, which is great because they have a obviously a hand bias. So the timings is great for us if they're nose poking. You could actually, we just, this is a simple DMTS. So we have a sample and we've got the choice of three possible stimuli and then they have to choose. Yeah, like it, it is unusual. We, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. We actually, the ones that you knocked out at the, the, yeah, PIM and they do their reaching. Yeah, yeah, no, this is. So one of the things that we, what we've thought about this a lot is it's essentially, it's a possibility of two things. We can untrain this behavior, but they're quite clumsy. The, the capacitive touch screen that we bought is fine because they've got very long nails. So it still does work even with nails, fortunately. But we think it's possibly because they like to perch. And as you can see underneath, there is a perch bar just here. So there's actually a little bar. I'll play it again. They're holding onto the bar. And yeah, and the maybe because they like to perch. And secondly, one of the on the first day of training, we actually stick marshmallow bits on the screen. So if it's just maybe just a redundancy from that behavior. But they actually we we're running three different trials now on them. So we've actually done delayed match to sample, delayed match to position. So quite similar working memory task. We've done a reversal learning, and we've done 
um, the DRST now in the space. Well, I'm trying to to yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but one of the really exciting things from it was that with the lesion animals, like a marmoset should be able to hold in memory. So with a delayed match, sample out to 12 seconds. So classically, unlesioned animals are holding in memory out to 12 seconds to be above chance. With the lesioned animals, this was only, they were only able to hold in memory for um, two seconds. And with the reversal learning, you know, the perseverative phase went on forever. We couldn't move them out of that perseverative phase, which was really interesting. Which, this is rich neck murder study, is it macaques? No, mama's S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's, we've added that data set to ours here for the control. Yeah. And then with the EEG, one of the really exciting findings is obviously it's been associated with prefrontal cortex and that low gamma in schizophrenia. We found low gamma, a loss of low gamma and high gamma as well in during just the preceding period before the task initiation. So this is all very current. We're working through this. Obviously, this has been since the move and recalibrating re a lot of this and rebuilding everything. But we actually are really excited about the fact that we've seen that loss in both low and high gamma, which is concomitant, which is what's observed in schizophrenia. So essentially, one of the things that we think we've got is essentially an anatomical behavioral, as well as a physiological construct of, you know, the multi-level dysfunction associated with schizophrenia. We're not saying it's schizophrenia, but it's very similar to that neurodevelopmental type of disorder. And it matches a lot of the other studies, you know, working memory tasks by Monac as well, and our own work in the PFC of humans and Woodward's work, with, and also the changes in the working gamma oscillations during task as well. However, one of the things that always, like, as Mike nicely said at the start, I've always, as you've probably seen from my studies wanted to really take it from a cell to system approach you know you not having the expertise but building that expertise within the lab having that molecular capability and you'll see a number of my other studies we worked on transcriptomics astral strike stroke but really starting to understand the full gamut of activity and what's going on here from both that molecular cellular perspective all the way through to this behavior to really correlate and that and really taking it away now because Essentially, what we've done is the sledgehammer approach. We touch in 0.1% of NMDA to a blatant area, but which is irrespective of anything that could be going on in a disease. So we're wanting now to get a little better of a handle on this. And how can we be more accurate at this with the tools available to us? Now, what we are next attempting to do is because we'd really like to be able to, in the adult animals again here, We've just got some animal animals. So we want to correlate that this dysfunction is associated with development and not adulthood. It's looking very positive, but that's all I want to say on that. But obviously with things like schizophrenia, there's a huge plethora and swath of data out there at the moment on the, from the GWAS, from Ninad Seston and other groups. And what we looked at was the pulmonary and you know, the number of genes that were associated with the schizophrenia and what were expressed in the Marmoset PM, which was 175. But one of the genes that is really exciting is the dopamine D2 receptor. Now, everyone goes, why is that? And that's because, really surprisingly, in the medial pulmonar, the only thalamic nucleus at birth has really high expression of DRD2 on the neurons in the medial pulmonar. And I show this figure here, this is from the Marmoset gene atlas from Tomomi Shimogori's group, but the level of DRD2 is as high as in the chordate. By one year, actually by nine months, which is the start of adolescence, it's dropped off. And does that fit with the, the dopaminergic fibers from us? I mean, are they there early and then not there? We haven't done that yet. So that's the next thing. So what we do know is those DRD2 positive neurons are actually the V-glute 
two positive neurons that are projecting to the frontal cortex or the frontal parietal temporal network. Also, what we think, and we need to do a little bit more to clarify this, is that it's, this is the RNA. So this is using RNA scope. What we, and when we look at the protein, the protein is down. So what we think is the protein is being actually translated and then shuttled to the terminals. So we really, what we're thinking is that the expression of the DRD2 is not here in the pulvinar per se, but is on the terminals in the cortex, probably as well where you're getting the input from the ventral tegmental area. And something's happening up there, which is you know out of my field, but we're hoping to get a little bit more. I'm sure we can talk more about this later <laughs> into and is a change that's happening around adolescence. We also think we're just, there's some suggestion as well from some of our data that there could be an input into the medial pulp and a, a dopaminergic input from the substantia nigra, but we want to confirm this. So this is all very exciting. We want to be able to, I've got uh, someone joining the lab that's got CRISPR-I capability with DCAS9. So we're hoping that we can actually knock down early in life the DRD2 expression and that we can use the dreads to do this temporarily as well in the future. But thinking about this, and I, I've got this very basic summary here about what the role is, and it's just that standard summary slide, but I, my, my thoughts about this, and I've had time to think a bit more because moving across the oceans, the work didn't happen when you come across at the end of a pandemic, you never know what's gonna be an issue do you? but it was very much that PIM, so the inferior pulvinar network, was really there to really drive the maturation of an area and be the end of that critical period. That was is essentially forcing the not forcing the closure, but driving the maturation, which would essentially be the corollary of an end point of the critical period. Whereas with the frontal cortex, we know that these critical periods go on for a number of years. So we're sort of thinking now, could it be that the medial pulmonar is actually a responsible nucleus for holding open that critical period? Is this nucleus and its inputs from all the multiple accessory association cortex really dry and being recipient of that inflammation? Is that actually enabling the window of plasticity to remain open for longer and not actually cementing the critical period at that point early on because it's still i think remarkable to me when you're with a six layer sheet of cortex how essentially everything's timed to close at a certain point and it's uh, it's mindless to think that that's not being driven by some or involves some subcortical system and i think how we've seen this huge expansion in the so for those that are more familiar with MD across the primates the and the anthropoids the correlation of the size of the medial dorsal nucleus is not that expanded that much whereas the expansion of the medial pulvinar has been huge so thinking about that is it like is there something to do with chronobiology here, which is about the timing when you, you've got to have this larger system here that's enabling this architecture to remain more fluid and responsible. So mainly being driven through that efference copy network through the medial pulvinar and the higher order thalamic nucleus at a, into adulthood. So that's just all very hypothetical at the moment, but that's essentially just to show you where we're going. And if we're thinking then finally about diseases such as schizophrenia, could it be essentially that, not that we sometimes think, and this isn't my field, but we sometimes think that the what's happening there is it's preventing the development in an area. But what, what we're seeing is, has it essentially, if this is theory holds true, has it actually essentially closed that critical window critical period at an earlier time point that makes it look like the area is immature but essentially hasn't enabled that window to be open for long enough so your window and looking into this when you're observing this in adulthood 
looks like a lack of development, but it was essentially because it was shuttered at a much earlier age. So of course, finally, this is essentially work that was done while I was in Australia, but you know, reimagining and rebuilding a, a great team here. These are most of the earlier PIM work was Claire and Inyaki, and Jack and Angela have moved with me from Australia. Jahan's coming shortly. And yeah, thanks for your time. It's wonderful to be here today. Questions? Well, thanks for an awesome talk. Um, Sounds like Mark um, when I say this. Sounds like Mark when I say that. <laughs> um, so you, you had this really awesome slide where you showed the extensive distributed connectivity of PM yep. cortex, right? Frontal, parietal, temporal. And I'm sort of worried, have you looked at with the PM lesion that how those distributed networks might reorganize? Do they reorganize? Do they have a sort of different topology to them? across development as a function of PM lesioning, like you sort of showed this nice convincing change in gamma uh, and, and connections with frontal. So I'm sort of curious, is, is there um, also a broader network story here that, that... Yeah, so one thing we showed, which is a preliminary, like we want to look at all the interconnectivity. So we looked at LIP to area eight, and we showed that there was reduced connectivity between cortico-cortical areas as well. Mm -hmm. But we normally there's a large abundance within the frontal eye fields from LIP to area 8 AD. Mm. And we saw very few. It was just a single animal because obviously it's very difficult to do multiple injections. And so we just thought we'd target a very strong connection across that parietal frontal network. And that was significantly reduced. From lesioning. From, from, from lesioning, yeah. 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 We really want to also look at the, that's why using the Grin Lens technology as well, we can target these neurons in, in multiple sites as well to see what the changes in the function across the networks are. But we do think that it's impacting cortico cortical networks. And that's why you see essentially into adulthood the loss of PV because we think that there is that cortico-cortical alignment at, in later stages as well with PV insurance, which is being initially driven by the medial pulvina. But that's why there is no obvious recovery because the networks, the cortico-cortical networks have been disrupted, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Head around this dual function, one in development and one in mental health. And there's kind of, you know, the correlation has got to be there. And usually in schizophrenia, we don't associate with a lot of visual aura or strange visual phenomena. Do you know of any phenotypic correlation that you're thinking? I mean, you've talked about some of them, but and and secondly, when you think about the developmental role of this. Do the retinal ganglion cells die once they're no longer needed in development? And do you see any? Yeah, I suppose I didn't, sorry, I didn't explain them well enough. So the medial pulmonary is not really any getting a strong visual input. So it's completely different. I think one of, like I was talking to Mike about this, I don't actually think the medial pulmonary is actually part of the pulmonary. I think it's been classified and it's, you know, because everyone classically thinks as pulmonary being this visual Nucle higher order thalamic nucleus. So I think that's a problem there. It's mainly it's it be possible that's just if you were re rewriting the anatomy textbook. I don't know at the moment because it's quite dis no 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 yeah it's it's distinct in itself and it's evolved. So would you think of the basal ganglia evolving? Potentially yes, I suppose. It's, um it's not really medial dorsal, though it aligns, it bridges it very closely. There is a distinct border there. The cell types are very different. The DRD2 is not expressed within MD. It's just, I, it's fine for now. I don't know, it's like John Cass and people, but it's, it's very distinct. And in terms of the inputs, it's still unknown truly what those inputs are. So, there is suggestion to be a small amygdala input. There is SC inputs very slightly, very few. We haven't really, we never found these in development, which was really surprising. 
So it does seem to be that it is, you know, it's essentially driven by the cortex. It is a true higher order thalamic nucleus that's being driven by the cortex. Yeah. Loops, it's yeah. It's supposed to bottom up. Yeah. Sensory input. So that's, I'm not saying it's based on anything, but mentally you want to sure. put it in the right box. So if you did it, if you didn't have blind sorting of areas, you know, using the column brain atlas or something, would it cluster with other dilemma nuclei? Would it cluster with, yeah. you know, cluster, you know, because of connections and neurotransmitters and all that? And didn't know anything about the, the centuries of anatomical yeah so once all the data comes out from the island on the human and in development i think that would be crucial here like the rodent data is useless at the moment because obviously there's no medial pole now but with all the better than be in a different cluster i don't say but maybe yeah it will be yeah thinking about wrong forever but it is like we want, we're starting to look at the transcriptomics because that I think is going to get to the, especially in, and developmentally. I think, you know, one of the issues today is we've really moved away from the Evo Devo field. And I think again here, this is a classic example of how important that is. You know, we've got, I've got a new world species here, and I'm not saying it's as greatly evolved as in other primates, such as macaques and humans, of course. But we can see that emergence of some of this phenomenon is, and it's it essentially goes back to the emergence of that frontal cortex, the granular frontal cortex. And I think that doesn't necessarily correlate to needing to have per se a medial pole, but it's the chronobiology over this time needed for maturation. It's a timing clock potentially in terms of uh, you know, ensuring connectivity is the interconnectivity is passing appropriately throughout the entire frontal parietal temporal junction. So rodents mature quite fast. Yeah, creatures mature quite fast. Yeah, marmots a little bit slower, macaques even slower. So, are there animal models that are not primates that mature very slowly? That maybe like is this really a a you know the the uh, medial pulmonar circuits and their role in keeping a window open? Like, could we look in other animals even outside of primates that really mature slowly? I don't even know. yeah. But I, well, you could think probably elephant or something. But you've sure. got the caveat there is have they don't have the necessary architecture in the cortex. So it's not just about well, the timing, right, right, it's right. about having a granular front, that yeah. a higher order cognitive function. Right. Because that's dependent on these circuits properly aligning. Oh, yeah, and but then, you might think, so is there another uh, thalamic structure if it's not the pulmonar that is yeah. connected with late maturing cortical regions? And is, could they be, you know, is there a sort of more general function? It's the medial pulmonar is doing that because of its connectivity. Sure. To the cortex. Potentially, that should be an earlier role for medial dorsal nucleus, which, yeah, you know, sure, sure. Which does have the connectivity with these areas as well. And I think that's something that's really it troubles me a little bit is not, not discounting the medial dorsal nucleus, but this area, there's already a really strong connection to, into all of these cortical areas from the medial dorsal nucleus. And then along comes this huge neighbor that's got exactly the same connectivity pattern what you know what at a gross scale but maybe at the fine scale like if you inject if you ablate md maybe you don't knock out the fs cells or the carbalbian cells yeah so, so one is md is doing information transfer and and medial pulmonar is doing you know not setting up the circuit the yeah micro circuit or whatever i mean just you can imagine different roles for them even though at a gross scale the concept yeah. is Similar because you need to do the, both of those jobs in every and all of the associations. Yeah, I uh, to me I thought about this a lot. Of course, is that MD could potentially be more essentially there of you know having that real efference copy network architecture that it's been described. But you know the medial pulmonary early in life is there very much as a real sorting office. You know, it's having to, it's taking information from all these different cortical areas and then passing it on to the right ones and doing that multiple times in a, a relay fashion, getting information back from the cortex from a very strong input, initially from layer five, then through to layer six, essentially saying, yeah, that's right. Or, you know, you've dispatched that wrong, go back and try again. So it's really, it's, 
pushing along that whole idea of it's you know gravitating towards being more of an instructive mechanism that needs to be have that longer opportunity it's not just there in how i showed in that previous example there in the first instance to say hey we've got to set you up quickly because you need to do this function pretty quickly but the function is more longitudinal i've gone on for a long time see there it wasn't quite five hours but it was a 